Welcome to another sessions of Profiles and Leadership interview series. I am your host, Steve Anderson, and today we are filming for the 2018 Graham sessions that will be held in January in San Diego, California. We have a very special guest today, Wendy Sue Swanson, MD. Wendy Sue Swanson is a pediatrician and chief of digital innovation and author of the Seattle Mama Doc blog for Seattle Children's Hospital has monthly global reach. She is working to revolutionize health communications by using social and digital media to bridge the gap between parents and doctors. As the first physician blogger for a U.S. hospital, she has led the way for novel use of social media in healthcare. Swanson speaks in the U.S. and internationally on physician use of social media, digital health, and innovation in advocacy and public health. Dr. Swanson founded Digital Health at Seattle Children's in 2013, leading a team in innovation by testing and creating new digital tools to leverage the wisdom of patients, families, and providers. Virtual Handshake launched in 2014, giving patient families information about the doctors and care team they'll, be, they'll meet during their visits, as well as education and tips to help before, during, and after their appointment or hospital stay. She is currently leading the build of two apps in partnership with pediatric researchers and clinicians. Dr. Swanson uses her voice to translate science to the public as Chief Medical Officer of Before Brands. She is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Communications and Media an official and an official spokesperson. She is on the board of advisors for Parents Magazine and is a Platinum Fellow on the board for the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media. She is a weekly medical contri contributor with NBC affiliate King 5 News in Seattle and is a practicing pediatrician with the Everett Clinic. She was named to Time Magazine's Best Twitter Feeds of 2013. Her first book, Mama Doc Medicine, Finding Calm and Confidence in Parenting, Child Health, and Work-Life Balance, was published by the American Academy of Pediatrics and is a Gold Award recipient of the Mom's Choice Awards. Dr. Swanson graduated with honors in psychology from Kenyon College. She earned an MD and an MBE, Masters in Bioethics, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and then completed her residency at Ch Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Swanson, thank you very much for spending time with us today. My so pleasure. Let's just start by hearing about your story. Uh, where did you grow up and at what point did you decide that medicine was the path for you? Yeah, I, how long do we have? No, <laughs> just kidding, I'm so sorry, I won't torture you. No, I, uh, so I grew up in Minnesota. My parents were, they're kind of a blend of um, kind of huge and fierce entrepreneurs and adventurous spirits, and yet I was raised in a really typical suburban environment until mm. they picked up, sold everything they owned, uh, and moved to rural Costa Rica when I was just in the middle of high school. Oh, wow. So went through kind of a traditional, typical childhood in some ways. Um, you know, played the oboe, did a lot of sports, the had a oboe. guinea pig. I was How did you normal. choose the oboe? I chose the oboe because my mom is a professional musician and okay. made me play piano, and she was my teacher. That is a miserable thing I to have can, your parent be yeah. a teacher. I was, my dad was my coach a few times. So yeah, so that. bad. <laughs> and so we got into big spats and fights, and in fifth grade she said, fine. And she took me to the orchestra a number of times, and she said, you pick out the instrument you want. So I picked out the oboe. Nice. The rest is history. And then I also played the English horn, which was a okay. big part of my, my high school years. And actually, I think really my experience of being a performing musician where I did a lot of performance through um, actually junior high and high school and even mm -hmm. during high school that was one of the ways I made a lot of money is I would job out through churches and synagogues to play my oboe for okay. like you know 50 bucks but it was easier than babysitting yeah, nice. uh, and fun but that really led me to kind of a, a performance I did professional theater in high school I took a half year off during my freshman year of high school and did professional theater oh, wow. and I think those experiences of performing um, wed with my own personal health challenges when I was a child and interacting with a tertiary healthcare system um, and being a patient uh, kind of came together at the confluence of how my careers really unfolded. I mean, I, um, I left college having studied and preparing to go to medical school, but uh -huh. went and did Teach for America. So yeah, did so domestic that. teaching in Oakland, uh -huh. taught bilingual education and, and, and loved it on some levels, but started to recognize and realize when I was teaching in Oakland that the day-to-day -day teaching 
probably wasn't the best way for me to kind of fit. I okay. loved the mission of Teach for America. It was kind of early. I mean, I'm old. So that was 96. <laughs> and so, you know, Wendy Kopp had founded Teach for America really on the principles of getting the best and the brightest into rural and underserved areas, right. taking those who were skilled and, and interested in science and technology and math to go into underserved areas before they went off and did something like medical school. Right. But as I was doing mm -hmm. it, I started to recognize that my connection and, and maybe my skill was about the translation of an overarching mission more than it was the day in, day out of teaching middle schoolers mm -hmm. curricula. Yeah. And I mean, it was, a, it was an amazing opportunity to learn how to talk and teach and listen and serve children. Um, but it was obvious to me at the beginning of that second year of teaching that I wanted to go to medical school. So mm -hmm. um, then went to medical school and, and then at the end of medical school I added on a master's degree in bioethics. Mm -hmm. And I really focused during that time on the forces at play between what we called then the doctor-patient relationship that we now call the patient-provider relationship really. Right. Um, and that dynamic mm -hmm. of that academic study in ethics and law and philosophy just kind of got me into recognizing and realizing that I knew going into pediatrics that was the right move, but I knew that I didn't want Monday to look like Tuesday or Tuesday to look like Wednesday, mm -hmm. and that I was really fascinated by, ha by what the media, traditional media, like just Katie Couric on the Today Show, what that did to the relationship of when you learn about something in the lay press, right. how does it change and transform how you ask questions or make a partnership with a therapist or a provider mm -hmm. of any kind? And then that kind of led to this career of thinking on how can I use my interest in almost performance and translation as someone who's deeply mm. concerned and cares about public health? Um, yeah. And then social media just like plopped on my lap. Right, nice. So when you go back to uh, those days in Oakland, in uh, inner city Oakland, yeah. what was what surprised you most about that experience? What what you what were you not prepared for? What did you mm. see that surprised you? I don't know. I think Teach for America prepared me to know that it, it wasn't going to look right or feel right. It was going to feel like failure, felt like failure most of the time. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I mean, my, my, my relatives, one of my uncles still makes fun of me. I remember on the first day, I'm going to swear. See, I knew I was going to swear. I was going to get edited out. Right? But like on the first day of school, mm. uh, a ninth grader took an eraser from the back of the classroom and threw it at me and said, yo, bitch. And it's like this really funny thing. Here we are, 22 years old, you know, blonde hair and light skin <laughs> yeah. in, a, in, a, in an Oakland where I was a true minority in right, that population. Right. So we had about 50% of the student population there was African American. But I was teaching the Latinos and, and then the second language speakers in physical mm -hmm. science. But, but just the kind of surprise, you know, one of my students was killed during the school year oh, from gosh. gun violence. And yeah. the surprise of just urban America, the surprise of even just what it felt like the true understanding of what a food desert is. So food desert, yeah. you know, is ultimately living in a community where there's not a there's great no supermarket. Stores, so, yeah. you know, kids would go at lunchtime or where I could go during the lunch hour to get something to eat. It was a convenience store. Right. I mean, so it was just kind of learning in just the tiniest dip what under-resourced or low SES urban America felt like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess that surprised me the most. And that it, and mm. I, I wasn't, I wasn't that good at it. I, don't, I mean, I think I made great connections with the students, but I don't think I was a gifted middle school teacher in those first two years, nor I, I think it'd be really hard to do that. Yeah, it would be. You state in your book that uh, every illness is a love story. What do you mean by that? Well, every illness is, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think in that blog and, and that section of the book, I talk about, as every parent knows, you know, there's this, when your child's not too sick, when they just get a fever and a cold, and they get a little clingy and a little lovey, and they sit on you a little bit more, there's just this kind of essential intimacy that's recreated. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one pediatrician of mine who was a mentor once said, toddlerhood is, is the most intimate time for the parent-child bond. Um, and she was saying that to me while her child was, I remember, a, a young adult and having a challenge with um, drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And I think she was just broken by it. But she was looking back at the times where there was just kind of physical intimacy and closeness. And I think illness does a number of things. Mm -hmm. It refocuses in our lives, our personal lives, what matters, right? Mm -hmm. When someone is truly ill or someone doesn't feel well, a child who's clingy or a partner or spouse who's ill or a mother-in-law or a mother um, or anyone that you care deeply about, right? It's easy not to go into work for a morning when you got to go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, it's easy to feel the connection and the profundity, right, of what love is in our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look around, I mean, we're sitting in Children's Hospital right now. Mm -hmm. If you walk these halls today, I mean, I, can, I could cry right here, but right. if you walk the halls 
and you look around mm. you, you will see love stories yeah. everywhere. I can imagine. These children are surrounded by a care team that cares deeply about their outcomes, but more importantly, and as we talk about transforming the health system, they are surrounded by caregivers who care more than anybody else about how well it goes. Yeah. There are love stories everywhere when someone is suffering. Yeah, and that gets lost, doesn't it, when we talk about the health care reform and all the numbers and all the dollars and all that. Uh, sometimes that piece that you just described is, is forgotten. So. Well, it's forgotten for good reason because what we're trying to figure out is how does the system allow people to flow through it better, right? right? How do we do it, you know, to the quadruple aim of how do we do it at lower cost of the best quality where patients are at the center, but we also think about the care team that provides it so they're right. healthy and well and engaged. But the, but the reality will always be, it doesn't matter how much artificial intelligence we roll in, how much precision medicine, how much genomics and proteomics, the realities will always be that healthcare consumption will be about relationships. I mean, yeah. you're talking to a group of physical therapists. Right. I think about, you know, that's kind of some of the most intimate care that's provided, hands-on teaching of rehabilitating from a painful or a post-operative space or chronic disease of how do you optimize, right, somebody's life by helping them gain strength, confidence, and an understanding of using their body. Yeah. I mean, that's an intimacy of a relationship that that will always be precious in the health Yeah, space. definitely. Another quote from your book along the same lines I enjoyed was you said, every day someone calls you a doctor, every once in a while you earn that title. So share with us an example of when you felt you earned that title. Well, it probably doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. um, I remember writing that post and writing that part of the book and that was about a story of, of a, a horrible and terrible night in the neonatal intensive care unit when I was a trainee. Mm -hmm. And one of my very sage mentors and, and attendings during that time, kind of putting that out there in the morning of like, we'd been up all night, we'd been resuscitating infants at 24, 25 weeks gestation, coding them, you know, keeping them alive through the night. And, and that night I earned it, you know, yeah. worked really hard, had to call for support, um, needed a lot of help, and then kind of put all of my own emotions at bay as it was all happening. And then the morning yeah. comes and you sit in the rounding room and you think like, kind of grab the chair, and you think, good grief, what did I just witness, right? Especially right. if you, you lose a baby or lose a child. Sure. Um, you know, recently it's harder for me. I mean, now that I work in kind of an executive level and a transformation level, earning the title of doctor, I mean, I think about it, I don't know, I, I guess the time I probably earned it the most was yesterday with my son as his mom, mm -hmm. when he went in uh, for a finger injury that I had blown off for a couple of days. <laughs> Everybody right. does that when you're in the healthcare yeah, space. Yeah. I was like, you're fine, you're, you're fine. fine. You'll, you'll and then I kind of looked at him and I was yeah. like, mm, he's dependent bruising, like he can't touch at this point there, he might have broken his finger, like we should go in. But I think, I actually sometimes feel most as a doctor when I'm functioning as an advocate for someone else and I yeah. was helping get him the right care, but I, I am um, so, sorry yeah. to be so circuitous about this answer. I think that um, I feel most deeply connected with being a doctor when the door is closed and I'm in an exam room and I take a parent from a place of worry and concern and furrow in their brow mm -hmm. to a place where I, I can believe earnestly that they feel more comfortable of what's going on, they know what to do, and we have a good plan. Everybody who provides clinical care in any way knows that the, the, the depth of, of um, kind of almost like spiritual gift you're given when you earnestly help somebody. Yeah, and, and it's hard in the administration, thought leader, health transformation, digital health space that I work most of the time to feel that as much, even though the hope is that I'm scaling those kinds of solutions right, and valuing. More people, so, but the one-on-one, yeah. -on -one, yeah. that's probably yeah, it. Yeah. It seems we have a common admiration for Atul Gawande and his ability to point out the tough questions that we must ask in medicine. You stated that you agree with him that we over-treat in, in healthcare today. Why do you think that is? Is it liability concerns? Is it that we don't really know the diagnosis as well as, as perhaps we should? Or in, in your case, is it, uh, is it because the, the, the parents demand it? Well, we do have a shared admiration mm -hmm. for him uh, you know and I think he's a brilliant communicator even in being mortal you know his most recent book on talking about end of life and leveraging his own it's experience a great book, yeah. 
um, of losing so his father. The first and, part is so hard to read, right? Oh yeah, gosh, which is what makes him such an amazing exactly, communicator. But exactly. he also, you know, when he wrote <clears throat> what a, uh, a little like a Texas town can teach us about healthcare, exactly. way back when in the New Yorker, right? Yeah. That was the beginning for me of understanding that a tool had a different way of communicating some of the stuff that we all walk around in the healthcare system and think about. But right. he can research it, be thoughtful about it, and communicate it. But you know, the over-treating of America is, a, you know, is what you're asking for. First and foremost, it can come from a place of suffering that, you know, we, we go to the doctor, let's say, in the, in the, in, and I, a therapist, provider, whatever, everybody. You go and seek help and care because you're in pain or you're anxious about something. Um, we don't do a great job in health care creating clouds and pockets of, of, of comfort with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. In America, we do think in binary ways. We want to know what the diagnosis is, we want to know what to do about it, and we want to solve it, and we feel entitled that that should happen immediately. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it kind of should, right? With, with better innovations and things, I mean, what we can do with our smartphones in our pockets, <laughs> we should right. be able to solve a lot of these quandaries and things. But in the kind of what some people call the diagnostic odyssey, when you don't have a clear diagnosis or something else, in that process of trying to get what you need, get rid of the anxiety or get rid of the pain, you often will over-evaluate it for all sorts of competing incentives, right? We mm. know that, it's like I was talking, I was at a, I, I just started a watercolor class. This is unusual, I was nice. there last week. Yeah, thanks, I'm so <laughs> arty. Uh, and it, I'm trying to like build this creative part of my life back because I've lost it to all this work. And the, um, I was sitting talking with, a group of women at this watercolor class and someone was saying, oh, I go to this, I went to this hand surgeon and she takes fluoroscopy and instead of going off to the x-ray, she just drops a fluoro machine on the finger and makes sure that there's no fractures there. And I said, huh, really good business model. Yeah. Now, probably really productive and helpful and useful and efficient. I don't know if this provider bills for it or not, but bringing a fluoroscope into your office, being able to bill for fluoroscopy before just sending it off for a standard, you know, two view film of a finger, is a way to keep your practice alive, serve your patients from a from a standpoint of experience. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary the amount of radi radiation you get from fluoroscopy versus a plain film? Maybe not. Is it is it necessary and is it billable? And but does it keep a practice alive? That competing incentive that maybe a hand surgeon has figured out how to keep everybody happy, do her work really efficiently, and get paid more for it actually yeah. cons is a huge amount of consumption. If we understood that if you need surgery for your hand or you maybe have a fracture in your finger, you could mm. probably wait for the two-view plain film and follow up tomorrow on the telephone or through a virtual visit in a way that's affordable, patient-centered, and just as effective, and perhaps of higher quality and safer. Right. But the, you know, one of the things that I, I chip away at, at that is a really complex space is that there is an illusion of high quality when you have high service. Yeah. And, and that is a very American way, yeah. right? To say, I deserve this to be better and friendly and perfect, which you do, mm -hmm. um, and I want this to be of the highest quality, but it's really hard to know what's high quality. We don't do a good job figuring out who's the best doctor, best surgeon, best pediatrician, best therapist, right? right. There are all sorts of different tools and health grades and Yelps and all these things to try to figure it out, HCAP scores, HEDIS scores, all those things in healthcare. But we're still bad at knowing, I point in a room of 100 pediatricians, can I tell you who's in the top? who's in the quartile, who's in the top half, and who's below average, you show me a doctor in this country who's gonna tell you that they're below average. Yeah. Everybody thinks they're everyone, in the top everyone half. Everyone gives quality. And I don't right. know if I'm a good pediatrician. Or I don't. I mean, I think I am, Sure. but do I really know that we don't know? So so it, just in that journey and that the, the maligned incentives that are not honestly about the highest quality care for a patient, that illusion that high service is higher quality, I think is a huge part of why we consume more, and I haven't heard a lot of people academically chipping away at that. Yeah, we've heard a little bit in the news lately that with symptoms that a patient reports and tests from, uh, results from tests, yeah. that algorithms are getting to the point where the computer might actually do better job of diagnosing the patient than the physician. Yeah, you, I mean, you that's think the that's kind of Watson artificial intelligence model. Watson, yeah. you know, IBM's solution. Right, right. Got in the game of healthcare and made these mm -hmm. huge proclamations, of which I think we know they're kind of currently falling short on. Right. I don't think they always will. So that clinical decision support right. that can come from artificial intelligence, I mean, wheel any machine in you want into any room that I'm in, I guarantee the computer's going to be smarter than my little, like, cortex mm -hmm. going through all my board's exams and board research. And, and I've done very well in that testing environment. And yet, 
that computer is always going to be smarter if I give it the right inputs. If you give it the right input. Right. right. So right. we should we should embrace clinical decision support and yet understand that there is mm. still a little bit of nuance in healthcare. But most of the reality is that there is something like the bell curve and it's real, and ninety five percent of us live underneath yeah. it. Everybody feels like they live in that outer five percent. You know, when you're consuming healthcare or your kid is sick or you feel sick, you usually feel like you're an outlier for some reason. Who you are, your your experience, mm -hmm. um, what your health background is, et cetera. You don't feel like you're schmack in the middle of this bell curve, and yet 95% yeah. of us are. So I know you've spent a lot of time on this. So how do you feel that digital health uh, can improve the, the experience between the patient and the provider? Well, my hope is that it... it uh, and the biggest broad brush stroke is that it kind of um, builds efficiency at bolstering kind of the intimacy that exists between people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in any way in a lewd or a crude way. I mean that in the reality that it is a precious thing when you are worried and scared to have a partnership with a clinician of any kind that you trust mm -hmm. to help guide you through a problem. And when I went online back in 2009 and started writing a blog and then I followed by using Twitter and then I started to use things like Facebook and then I started to use YouTube and I started to use mass, mass or local media or whatever it was, my relationships with people, this is anecdotal, but my relationships changed. When people who were following me saw my passion and dedication to science, my positioning of vaccine education in a blog post and on social media and talking about it as a mom and talking about it as a community member and talking about it as a pediatrician and, and, and being in arm's reach of science, that what I started to recognize was this one-to-many, this idea that I could use a tool and share who I am and what I believe and what mm -hmm. I think the science tells us could be an efficient way to allow for kind of fostering a better relationship at large. So that's, that was my introduction to it. Yeah. Now when I look at digital health and you know we're building, we're building technology here at Seattle Children's and then we're using outside technology and kind of innovating it, you know, what I understand is that we, we can't continue, of course, to provide healthcare the way that we have. Right. You know, if I think about it from like a physical therapist, light, mm -hmm. bend, whatever it is, it's like, I don't know, think about patellofemoral syndrome. So mm -hmm. that's a syndrome that's fairly, can be fairly common in adolescent girls, right. can be just kind of a common syndrome. Now, we could send you to a physical therapist um, and you could see a physical therapist at a certain cost and there could be that high touch in, in care. But there could be potentially a broker digital solution that allows a lot of education and training to a family before they get in. Sure. Then they go and get support from a physical therapist. And then maybe a physical therapist has a virtual check-in twice a week for two weeks and it's right. done. Right. And the cost on that, the care, but that the intimacy of understanding that we're pretty, we trust FaceTime. When my family is across the globe, I get on FaceTime and I, I, they're the same people. I can yeah. feel a lot of that communication energy. So that I think digital is just gonna provide the efficiency and the broker of being a broker of mm -hmm. caring for a larger set of people with individuals in the system and then organizing and aggregating the things that are relevant to kind of the inputs in the system that we talked about almost in the artificial intelligence yeah, way. Yeah. I'd like to discuss with you your approach to the work-life balance and how, you, uh, how your decision to pursue leadership roles comes into play. Uh, what challenges you the most in your current role as it relates to your responsibilities as a practicing pediatrician and then the Chief of Digital Innovation at Children's Hospital, just to name a few of the many things that you do. So the question is, what challenges me most in my work-life balance nightmare? Exactly. Yeah. Well, everybody, I think, feels the work-life balance nightmare. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of um, gauche to even say, like, I'm so busy. Well, like, you're so busy today, right? right? We're all Everyone's so busy. busy right? Because you can be busy because there's a lot in the world to consume. Right. Some of us are more busy with work and deliverables and work. Some of us are more busy with creative mind space. Some of us are more busy clinically delivering. Some of us are more busy because our children or our family or our loved ones or our network demands more of us, right? We're all mm -hmm. busy. Um, I think acknowledging that helps me and brings me peace. I mean, there are days, to be very frank, where I know I'm failing where I am like, I can feel the stress like teeming in my chest, like rolling around in me of like, mm -hmm. I'm doing a work meeting on the phone, I'm running, I mean, even this morning, the number of phone calls that I've done, the carpool that I drove, I played two podcasts during our carpool. I did the How I Built This, which is an amazing <laughs> podcast by Guy Raz at NPR. Yes, it's yes. basically entrepreneurs. It's such an inspiring podcast. And then we listened to this Brains On. I mean, so I brokered podcasts for a, a carpool of four kids driving across school. I had two <laughs> calls with my startup that I work for, um, was getting ready for this. We had a call. We were finalizing an app that we're building at Children's that I took the call while I was switching cars from carpool, 
to my home to get it so that my nanny could use the car for pickup in the afternoon so I could get in another car so I could come here. I put makeup on while I was on a call for this interview, <laughs> right? I mean, that's my morning this morning, yeah. right? And I actually made a hot egg sandwich for my kids for this breakfast. because it's only 9.30, we should say, right? It's 9.30, yeah. <laughs> so a lot has already happened, as it mm. has for everybody else, right? It's hard. Right. I've got these two amazing kids at home. My, you know, my, my partner and husband at home is also an academic physician and has to get out the door early. We dropped him off, actually, at the hospital on the way to carpool. You know, I mean, that's crazy, right? I think that what you do is you kind of say... What do I want my life to be with? I mean, there's some really lovely, like, TED Talks. Um, I'm blanking on her name all of a sudden. Sorry. Um, we'll get to it. We can insert it later okay. uh, when it comes to me later. But even talking about, like, what does stress do to you and how do you, uh, like, stress can be really bad on your body. We know that. Right. Stress might be something that you kind of feel it flow in and you kind of take it in and say, this is who I am and I get energy in this way in a really positive way and I get energy in this way in a negative way. And when I feel it, can I just, like, let it be a part of me? So I sometimes do that. But I think the ultimate wisdom I get from other people who teach me about work-life balance is that uh, two things. One of my mentors when I was a resident said to me, I was, I was getting ready to do a talk on media and medicine. It was just as I was beginning my career. And he said, Wendy Sue, you don't have to do everything in the beginning of your career. You don't yeah. have to tell everybody everything you think right from the start. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. one thing is like, just let yourself have a pace, right? Uh -huh. That you don't have to solve everything. I mean, I do have like four jobs and I love that working for a television station, working for a hospital, working for a clinic, working for a startup. But I, it helps me understand this system and how to hopefully be an agent of change in it and how to enjoy my life. Um, but the needs of my children, my, my own personal health needs, the personal health needs of my family, my mother, my partners, my friends who call me and text me for health advice because the system fails them all the time. Right. Um, you know, um, I get, it's like you, you mm. just have to pace yourself and understand that the target is always moving right. and it's okay. If what you decided worked last week doesn't work this week because your kid's older or somebody's sick or you don't feel right, it's just yeah. like in yourself having the courage to listen to when, it, like the, when your cells are going sideways to say, I got to do it differently, yeah. whatever it is, and actually to trust yourself enough to do it. And I'm not, I'm not that good at it. So I would say I give myself kind of low ranks. Yeah. Um, and low grades, I feel like I'm self-aware, which I feel proud of, but I don't necessarily live my days uh, in harmony yeah. in the way that I would that I sure. would really love. Judgment from others is hard to shake sometimes, and you state in your book that the power of choosing motherhood and not judging other women based on mothering choices should be what we do. Can you expand on that and share with us a little bit of what you're getting at with that statement? Well, I think that came from the place of how I've approached helping families understand the science and safety of vaccines. That you could go out and say, the science is clear, these people are morons that are doing it that way. Or you could say, the science is really clear, it's on the side of vaccinating your kid on time following a safety mm -hmm. tested schedule recommended by the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And then I can also say that something about that mother who doesn't want to vaccinate her kid and something about me as a mother are the same. And it's probably that we want our kid to get through childhood and live until they're crotchety and old and, and over a pain. Yeah. And what she understands and believes because of her amygdala and the emotional centers in her brain and what she's understood about what, she's, what the concerns are of those who maybe don't trust the science is relevant. So our approach and potentially our ability to make change in, mm -hmm. in actually is, is in one of not judgment. But I'll tell you, more than any time in my life at least, I feel now we live in a very judgmental, partisan, angry, um, finger pointing, pretty disrespectful space in the United States. And it's becoming harder and harder. But if we took the time to say, you're different than me, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and you're making a choice I don't agree in. You take that in the provider-patient relationship or patient-provider relationship, right. you take it in your personal life, you take it wherever you want. If instead I said, with empathy, I'm gonna do my best, I'm so frustrated, yeah. And I'm going to do my best in this moment to think, you probably have a similar goal. Right. And we're just coming about it, right, from these very different vantage points. And ultimately, I think our experience of providing advice or care, our experience of teasing out an angry fight in our neighborhood or helping our kids or looking at the other mom who we think is making a crazy choice, our experience of it, if we can just stop judging so much at first glance, 
and think carefully about where are where are we aligned. Right. We maybe can just have a much better And just to take it from their perspective, if I say maybe from their perspective they're looking at it this way and I'm looking at it from a different way. And, and, well, it sure would be great if know. we all did that. The problem is we're human and a little yeah. bit pathetic and we get angry and <laughs> short and judgy. And it's just kind of how we're wired because we're, we, were, we were raised to categorize by gender, by color, by age, right? But yeah. we have all these implicit biases that, that accumulate as well. So uh, nothing I'm telling you is new yeah, for yeah. Who, who your listeners, but I... Um, you know, it's Alex Drain, who's who's an entrepreneur who founded Eliza, who is the one who over the years has pounded into my brain. She's an entrepreneur in the health space, but she's pounded into my brain like, let's look at this with empathy. Yeah. If, if we start with empathy, in any personal challenge or work challenge, if we start with empathy first, it is a completely different experience. It's just like when your kid's having a tantrum on the floor too, right. when they are kicking and screaming and head banging, and you're in the middle of Target and you're like, ah, I look like a crazy person. <laughs> Instead of getting angry with your kid, if you went and thought, yeah. my baby feels awful right now. Right. He can't get what he wants so much so that he has taken his body and he is thrashing it on the floor. <laughs> and if instead I go to him with empathy that he is suffering as much or maybe even a little less than me in that moment, but I go to him with empathy. When I, I mean, I had, a I had a tantrumer. So when I started going, when I read this whole article about what's called the anger trap of a tantrum, that it's actually these kids are suffering and anxious and feeling d just extreme discomfort. When I started presenting myself to him as a helper, as opposed to like, you're getting in my way, right? right. Completely changed the dynamic of yeah. those tantrums. They didn't stop, but it made it so made much it better for me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You have many pearls in your books, and I really like uh, a child need lo needs love, not time. And parenting is consistency, the listening, the remembering. Parenting is the most important job any human has. And how would you describe your strategy when it comes to parenting your two growing boys? So you basically just said one um, in, in your explanation, but what, yeah. what's your, what, how would you describe your strategy? Well, that strategy of kind of love first came from my mother-in-law, who mm -hmm. was such an example to me in my life. She's since passed away, but like that was her, like I asked her one time, like, well, how, do you, how did this happen that you raised these four kids who love each other and love you so much? And why is it all so functional? <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> how did that work? Because my, my husband's family is just kind of profound that way. And she said, well, I just looked at every decision and I thought whenever something's tough, if I just make my decision out of love, mm -hmm. I can't, I won't regret it. So that has helped guide me in those kind of moments. You know, mm -hmm. with my own boys, um, it's, a, it's a shifting target. I think it's like I, I try as best I can to just be myself. Yeah. I mean, I think um, they deserve that in the hard changes in life and the challenges. They deserve the model of that. They deserve for me to tell them when I don't understand something, when I feel like I, like today, we were late for school. That whole nightmare carpool I described earlier, <laughs> part of it was my fault and my son was whimpering in the back seat and he's like, it's just always my fault. And I said, you know, it's just not only your fault, but it's a little bit your fault today, but it's a little bit my fault mm. too. And you know what? I failed you again, Finney. Like, yeah. that's what happened today. But I mean, I think it's this like vulnerability to say what I do mm. great, what I do poorly. But really, ultimately, at the end of the day, I am going to grab onto those kids and I am going to like kiss them and eat their ears <laughs> until they won't let me do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And every decision that seems really tough, I'm going to keep making them out of love. I mean, I don't, yeah. it's just that. It's that's like sweet. if I can just be as authentic as I feel in all those moments with my kids, I don't. I don't think I'm going to do it the wrong way. Now that that doesn't mean when I'm scared because there's a um, uh, you know there's a hurricane coming, or I'm right. scared because we're talking about North Korea that might launch a missile into Seattle. I got to get myself together a little bit too, even and not show them all the fear, right. but let them tap into it in a way that I think actually That's affords scary. them the opportunity that I'm always on a journey to. Yeah, are you familiar familiar with love and logic, yeah. that strategy and yeah. choices and uh, yeah, so yeah. it's a similar similar yeah. approach. Yeah. Yes. Share with us a story when you took uh, your six-year-old son at the time uh, with you to a TED Talk and what his reaction was watching his mom kind of do her thing, but also listening to the other speakers as well. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do is share, I've been afforded this amazing career where I get invited to go all over the world to talk. Mm -hmm. And one of my, and I talk all over the United States, and I don't bring my kids to a lot of, they go to school, they have their own lives, they don't have to right. get on airplanes with me like I have too, but um, when I go on an international trip, I usually try to alternate taking my son, each one of my sons with mm -hmm. me. And that started with this trip to the Netherlands where I was asked to do this little TEDx talk. But what was so profound about it, and I read the blog post I wrote about it was, I love being a working mom. 
because mm -hmm. we hear so much about how that kind of banter between staying at home and working and the tension there, but the overwhelm that we feel as working moms. We don't sit around and say, thank goodness I'm working and got asked to go to a foreign country and I get to bring my six-year-old with me. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was like I get to show him the world because of the sacrifices um, of other people, but also the privilege that I've had in my life afforded to me by the education and by the financial security of my family when I was growing up and the safety and security of my suburban neighborhood, all these things. But he got to go with me, but he, what was, what was remarkable is that you know, we underestimate our children all the oh, time. Yeah. And he sat, so the journey of that day of the TED Talks was talking about the beginning of life, that's when I talked in kind of the pediatric space, talking about the middle of life and talking about the end of life. And as the day unfolded throughout the day, talks throughout the day where he sat in the audience as a six-year-old the entire day with a bunch of Dutch people who'd just kind of taken him in for the day when I was particularly backstage and even doing my own talk, and, and, you know, and, and experienced some of the mementos of what people were sharing mm -hmm. about the healthcare space, about longing and suffering. But the end of the talks were really about the end of life and there were some beautiful TED Talks at that presentation that day about the end of life. And at the end of the day, um, at the end of the TED day, a, a whole ceiling of origami cranes fell down on the audience, which my son, is, he's six, he just loved and he, yeah. he kind of like scoured and collected all the origami cranes. And then we went back to this little hotel and we were in these little twin beds in this little tiny kind of European room at the end of the day, and he said, um, I hope I quoted perfectly from the book because I did not review this, but he said to me, he was like, we were looking at the cranes, and he said, well, mommy, life can be so beautiful. And like at that, you know, you'd kind of yeah. be like, this is the best moment of my whole life. Right. My six-year-old is like, got, got it. He's connected with being alive. And then he said, but mommy, death can be so beautiful too. Yeah, that's pretty profound from a six-year-old. It's amazing what they pick up. It's really amazing. It's so, amazing. What they yeah, it's I mean, just amazing. If in now uh, turning eleven next week, you know, yeah. I think um, he might understand it better than I do. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I wouldn't doubt that. Your book states that perfection on the working parenting fulcrum simply doesn't exist. Are parents today trying too hard to find that perfect parenting approach? I think we're telling them they are right, yeah. and I think um, I talk a lot about that. Those who have enough resources to have shelter and food and not worry about it, which is not everybody, right? Medium yeah. income in this country for a family of four is about $55,000. We know a significant portion of children across this country and families are hungry every day. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can meet the Maslow's needs, um, then I think you get into this place of kind of perfecting what you're doing. And we've done that by the kind of overabundance of information that's coming at parents and families, telling them how to. And, and you know, here I am the kind of person, I make a lot, I make a podcast every week, I write a blog post almost every week, I go on TV and talk about parenting and health, and I contribute to that volume. Um, but it isn't, it isn't that people don't have enough information, it might be that they have too much. Yeah. And I think, you know, everybody at the end of their life or these sage people around us that are telling us things all the time are like, you know, kind of don't sweat the small stuff is what, it all, what life really comes down to. Yeah. And I think um, the most beautiful moments of our lives come when we're fully present and not distracted by technology, stress, work, anxiety, phone calls, whatever it is. And we're actually just with people or maybe with nature or yeah. with ourselves. And I think, um, we are going. We are in the fight of our lives as digital tools and technologies mm -hmm. invade our lives to compartmentalize and make space still for that kind of simple little things. Well, just like yeah. the simple beauty of being alive and not having yeah. pain in your body in a certain time. Yeah, absolutely. In today's world, is it shocking to you that women still make seventy cents on the dollar to what men do for the same position? And how does that happen in today's equity world? I mean, in your position. Um, uh, I know you mentioned it in your book and, and as a uh, CEO of a, of a company, you know, I, I, I still am shocked when I hear that figure, but, it, but it's real. Yeah, hard for me to answer this because um, I'm, I'm kind of angry about it. I think right now also we're facing nationally the way that women are treated differently in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. um, In my own experiences and in my experiences of reading and thinking on how to change that reality that women are still paid 70 cents on the dollar, I believe 70, some 70 cents on the dollar depends on right. what stat you look at. I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it, is, it is kind of culturally created from the beginning. I mean, even take the example of um, 
you know, I'm raising my children with my partner and husband, who is also an academic physician. I'm not an academic physician. He's an academic physician. Uh -huh. He works full time. I work full time. Nobody talks to him about his work-life balance. People ask me about it right. all the time. Right. Is that because I have two X chromosomes and my, the babies were born in my uterus? I mean, what is it? Yeah. Um, but it. But at the same time, I read Lean In. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg right before I negotiated my job here at Seattle Children's to, uh, at the time, be the executive director and found our Center for Digital Health. Right. And I read that book. Actually, I started reading that book when I was doing that TED Talk. I read it part of it uh -huh. on the train in the Netherlands, and then I came back and finished the book. And I read it just before I negotiated that job. And one of the things that Sheryl Sandberg says in that book that I always think about is every time you're a woman, particularly in an executive position, make sure that you know when you are when you are negotiating your job, you are negotiating for yourself, but more, you're negotiating for every woman who's going to come behind you mm -hmm. into the place where you're working. And I remember I was a little bit stalwart, and I was a little strong, and, and I was a little stronger than I would have been had I not read the book. And that was the beginning for me of thinking on, you know, I've had the privilege to grow an all-female team in my digital health team and think really carefully of how do I make sure that they're paid equitably across the organization, partnering with my HR department, but also understanding the different risks they take on and make sure that I'm guiding them to know how to fight for themselves to make sure that they're looking around and making sure equity does exist and that the, who they are and how they come to work and how they contribute to a mission of an organization like where we're lucky enough to work at Children's, um, but make sure that they're valuing themselves. So I think it's, it's, it's my job to keep telling you, I think there have been problems in my own compensation at times mm -hmm. in my life through different employment or organizations and experiences. I have been treated very differently as a professional speaker than I think men are treated. Um, not even just on equity, but what is what is discussed about my talk after, for like what shoes I wore. I mean, <laughs> have you ever gone on stage and had someone get up after you and talk uh, about the shoes you're no, wearing? No, I never have. Turns out it happens <laughs> to women speakers, right? I yeah, mean, I can the experience of of how we kind of culturally raise each other and ask these questions are still really a part of this, but ultimately it's going to be continuing to voice your concern and fight for yourself. And as I said, you know, we watched um, Hidden Figures with my kids. Yeah. So I don't know if you know that movie. Uh, that's a great movie, yes. The audience knows that movie. You know, it's really mm -hmm. about these NASA mathematicians, African-American mm -hmm. NASA mathematicians way, way back in the beginning days and the kind of fight. But I watched it with my boys and I said, you know, feminism has had its peaks and its troughs and its valleys. And we can look back at Gloria Steinem, all these things. And most women go through an, an arc and most men go through an arc of feminism through their lifetime. But it ultimately is going to be mostly held by men of how feminism and pay equity will come. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, you know, there's a scene in the movie where, where um, it's not Kevin Costner, who's the, who's the, no, maybe it is. Well, he takes a sledgehammer to the bathroom where right, they have a colored right. and seg segmented. And I said, yeah. there's going to be a time in life where you're going to, as a white boy, growing up to be a white man, because my kids are white, growing up to be a white man, where you're going to take some sort of sledgehammer on behalf of someone who's either a woman or has not as much privilege as you do, who's probably smarter than you. Yeah. And you're gonna be smart enough to defer to their intelligence and capacity and get out of the way. Yeah, awesome. And it's, it's not women that are gonna change how women are paid alone. It is also men standing up and saying, it is absolutely not tolerable to pay people differently based on what their chromosomes look like. Yeah, couldn't agree more. You have stated that women are continually reminded to question their choices differently than male counterparts. We just talked about that yeah. in the workplace. Yeah. Um, and, and even when they are sharing parenting, um, parenting responsibilities, are we making progress with this, or is this yeah. bias? Uh, you know, just a, of a course bias. we're making progress, right? I mean, let's look at the 1950s model of a single working household. We know. The majority of families in the United States have dual working families. It's right. not that the you know we're all we're all working a lot and we're all sharing and I would call it co-parenting. I mean it's funny I think we use the word co-parenting in, in separated and divorced parents of children, and yet I think about that in all families. Mm -hmm. Most I mean so many of my friends and colleagues are dual working families where they're really swapping the spit and sharing. And I think as we've figured out, like look at the Gates Foundation leading the way and saying we're going to give a year of maternity leave, but we're also going to give a year of paternity leave too. As yeah. we start saying it's just as important for fathers to be present as it is for mothers to be present. And as our workplaces gradually evolve to truly value that, um, we will be afforded more and more sharing. But I'll tell you in my life, with my multiple jobs, my extensive travel and the roles and responsibilities I have at home. It is, I, I do not do, I, I would say someday there are weeks where I'm doing the minority of things and my husband who's a full-time physician as well is doing more. Yeah. So um, 
hopefully we can just keep saying and sharing and learning these experiences. But you know, b before Cheryl Sandberg, I'll tell you too. I mean, as such a thought leader in that space, uh, especially a vocal point in that space, mm -hmm. you know, you know, before her 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 first husband died or her husband died, you know, she talked about the reason that she'd had this profound career was in part because she chose a partner who supported her. Right. So it's this dual support of each other of kind of trading and shifting your weight for your jobs and for your family and for your kids. But yeah. I do think we're making progress, and I do think we have a long way to go. Yeah, we'll really yeah. know we're there when there is equitable pay, mm -hmm. and there's affordable childcare, and people have equal paternity and maternity rights in the ways that they want them. Then we'll be there. It's going to be a while. Yeah, and related to that, you quoted the uh, Anne Marie Slaughter when she said, "When I'm away from my children, I am always less whole." Mm -hmm. And in reading that, I I said I asked this about my wife, and we discussed this. Do you think women, men and women feel this differently? No, I think we probably describe it differently. Okay. I mean, how could I possibly believe that um, my brother, who is most closely related to me genetically of anyone on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. We're most like our siblings if we have the same parents than anyone else on the planet. How could I possibly believe in my heart that he loves his kids less than I do, and that when he goes to work, he's less worried, distracted, engaged, or think of them as important. I mean, I, I don't. I think we've lived in these cultural constructs that have kind of defined and galvanized our roles of how we check in, who calls. It's like, yeah. you know, when there's a play date, somebody reaches out to me first, because they're kind of right. like, oh, Wendy Sue, but now actually they've learned they should probably call my husband. Yeah. But, but, but the, um, I think we just, mm. I think we put different sound bites to this. Yeah, but, but wouldn't you say that as a, that mothering instinct, that mothering, I mean, you carried these kids in your womb, you yeah. you feel, I mean, is there just that mothering part that, that it's not good or bad or right or wrong, it's just mm. different than a man might feel? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the men in my life who I have loved, mm -hmm. my brother, my, my deep, deep, dear friends, my husband, I sincerely don't think <laughs> yeah. that it is less emotional for them. I think, nor do I think they're less engaged or invested. I think the way, at, um, like for example, the kind of role of being a provider maybe, or the mm -hmm. role of being a securer, or the, I think there might be some hardwired stuff that is nature, nurture, and then, uh, n you know, the culture changes that. But you're just not going to get me to say that I am, it, when I think about my two boys, and I, I'm, I'm using my anecdote here, but I, I mean, my, my environment and my brother's environment and my own family mm -hmm. environment, the way that my father and the way that my own personal mother have interacted with me and supported me in my life are, mm -hmm. are profoundly different and actually follow gender stereotypes. Yeah. Um, but I don't think at the essence on the, my father's last breath, if he had a clear mind that I, do, do I really think cares less. I don't know. I, I don't, yeah. you're not going to get that from me. That's great because uh, uh, my wife came up with the same answer as we <laughs> we discussed it. So it's, I it's just think very, it, yeah. I think we've made, <clears throat> we've made space for it differently. Yeah. It's like we have to have Movember to, you know, men don't shave their faces because <laughs> we're trying to get men to go to the doctor, right. right? We've just created a different culture around caregiving, seeking, running healthcare. Right. We know that women typically run the healthcare of a household. But we've done that. That's not because the men that aren't going to the physical therapy appointment or getting the immunizations mm -hmm. and doing the flu shot, it's not that they care less. They've been reared to think on their responsibilities differently. And yeah. it's our obligation. If we do want equity and we do want to share these things and we want everyone to have as rich and spiritual and exciting of a life as possible, is to invite men into the same rooms that women have been invited into for millennia. Yeah, yeah. I love your quote when you say, insanity is okay. It's okay to have more commitments and a busier schedule than others, and it's okay to like it that way. Do you really like it that way, or do you question whether it's sustainable for the long haul? I don't know. You should call <laughs> my therapist. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm a little burnt out. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of this decade sprint that I've had, and I do, as you know, have five jobs or whatever. Um, <clears throat> If you include my mom title, which is the first one, if you look at my Twitter bio, very intentionally, it's the first title. Right. Um, I mean, I, I talked once with a, 
uh, an ex-ophthalmologist who was kind of a coach, like just for an hour, a, co a career coach, that somebody said, you should go talk to her. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who said to me, you know, what we know about, let's, I don't know that I, if I am or am not a gifted person and how I think or how intelligent I am. And I think gifts, we, we hyper-focus on certain gifts and don't on others in, in mm -hmm. our children and in our lives. But I remember her saying, you know, there's kind of this way that we love the Zuckerberg story. We love the idea that you take one problem and the really smart, productive person in the world solves one problem, nose down, 30 years or whatever it is, and yeah. that's the way to do it. We love it because it's easy and it's simple and you can define it and it's a way to rationalize a lot of decisions. Mm -hmm. But she was talking to me about there are just some people whose minds are not satisfied unless they really have five balls in the air. And if you don't right. have five balls in the air, your brain's a little dull. It's a little turned off, right? But it's chaotic and it's inattentive and it's all sorts of quandary and, and cacophony in it. But I'll tell you, like, it, for me, one thing only is probably not going to get me as excited as sure. doing five things at once. So, yeah. um, but it, it isn't perfect. And maybe I won't live till I'm 99. I really <laughs> want to. Yeah. But I might, I might, you know, I might chap myself in the sun of this heat, and I don't know. Yeah, and and you made reference to it earlier that you know the work-life balance or this this feeling of burnt out or whatever, it goes in and out. I mean, there no know, question, right? We all yeah, know that. Exactly. Sunday nights so. can be really bad in some jobs. Yeah. Friday afternoons can be really bad in other ones. I mean, you you kind of it's like sometimes it's awesome. And sometimes it's really agony, and it's just I don't think it's ever going to be perfect all the time. And yeah. and because our needs are shifting, and our jobs are shifting, and our bosses shift, and our coworkers, I mean, you know, like it's yeah. a moving target too. And that's why we talked earlier. It's it's like it's unrealistic to think that you're always going to have uh, life balance. Sometimes you're going to be out of it. Sometimes well, some people you're take it and say there is none, and stop using it, and stop yeah, seeing exactly. it because this illusion. And Anne Marie Slaughter said that right in her right. piece in the Atlantic, which was the kind of quintessential. You, you can't. I think the title was you can't have it all. This is like right. five years ago now. Um, you, you can't have it all. Well, maybe you can, but you have to you have to redefine what all is. Right? It, yeah. We keep projecting that you can kind of do it all. Well, what is it all? And it actually only resides within ourselves of what we want out of our precious. I mean, you know, my, my favorite poet is Mary Oliver, and I mean. A quote in in um uh, in one of her poems in Truro Bears. It's in that book, but it's called A Summer's Day, and it is such a guiding light for me. And, and it 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 guides so much when I'm in heartache, things are upset. But she says, "What will you do with this one wild and precious life? Mm -hmm. Only yeah. you know what yeah. you want out of it. And it is the pristine life is probably." putting your earmuffs on to what everyone is telling you makes a great life yeah. and you determining from within constantly what is it that you're going to do with your one wild and precious life. Yeah, and it's different for everybody. So yeah. what my work-life balance solution is versus yours versus somebody else's, the minute we start saying there's a formula is the, is the minute we admit that we're judge, 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 judge. You decide what's great. Only you know if you're doing it well. One of the best questions you can ask an adolescent as a pediatrician, I think, is, are you making good choices? Yeah. And adolescents will tell you. They'll be like, eh. Yeah. Right? They know if they're kind of like doing the wrong thing. So are you? And you don't have to yeah. answer me. And, and most of the time, I'd probably say, no, I am, I am not <laughs> doing this right right now. I yeah. have got no Mary Oliver Zen today. Right? Yeah. Like, so it's a work in progress. Yeah. It resonated with me when you wrote, happiness is someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Someone else said that. I don't think I said that. I was quoting somebody, I think. Well, okay. I, <laughs> I just, I'm worried. I don't want say, to take credit. Let's say it it's a quote. Me. Let's say it it's a too quote. Good. Yeah, okay. So I know that you have people to love, and I know you I have do. plenty to do. I do. So what do you hope for? I'm 43. I had cancer when I was 37. It was, it was mild. It was little. It's cured, I hope. I think yes. about it every day, though. Um, and my peers have died, and people in my parents' generation are dying off, you know. Um, I hope for more knowing every day that how I spent the day was kind of the most beautiful day I can imagine. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a, I mean, that's kind of maybe a cop-out answer, but it's real. Like, I really just hope for kind of a peace with um, connecting to Marty Seligman, Dr. Marty Seligman or Martin Seligman founded Positive Psychology. He's a professor at Penn where I went to medical school. Mm -hmm. And I never interacted with him when I was at Penn. And he's written a bunch of books, one of them called Flourish. But his, his philosophy and his distillation of a meaningful life. 
a good life mm -hmm. is saying identify your greatest gift and use it for the greatest good yeah that's great and it's never going to be the pursuit pursuit of pleasure that's going to get you to a really meaningful and happy life and i mean happy in quotes because i don't want to oversimplify because i don't think life is ever just happy right. but i think if i can get like i hope for like kind of a peace maybe in the frenzy or maybe in a different cadence or tempo in my life later on <laughs> that isn't so kind of hectic <laughs> yeah. and, and kind of compulsive. But I just really hope for that. that on, and I feel like I'm working really hard at saying, what am I really good at? And how am I going to use it, hopefully through digital or even doing something like that? How am I going to use my gift as a translator, as a spokesperson, as a, a pediatrician, as a mom, whatever it is, as a technologist? How am I going to use that for as many people as possible um, so that I feel I'm contributing to leaving this planet healthier, happier, safer, more peaceful than it was when I was born in 1974. And that my hope would be that I probably have a little bit more watercolor and a little bit more sunshine and a lot more time outside running mm -hmm. in nature than I do today. Yeah, great. So to end here, you have described that single moment when everything feels right. Share with us when you experienced that moment. Uh, I can think of a couple. Uh, that can sometimes be, I think, uh, when I'm connected with someone I really love. Mm -hmm. And I think the other moment that I may, you may be alluding to, and I, I can't think of it since then, was when my son was about four months old. And I was down in, in Costa Rica with my extend, my family, my, new, my childhood family, in our, in our eco lodge in Costa Rica. And I was working three days a week then as a pediatrician. It was before I started all this hoo-ha. And I remember he was sitting on my lap, and I thought, he's so beautiful, mm -hmm. this four-month-old baby. He's mm -hmm. so healthy. The sun is shining. And I think for once, I don't need, I, I feel a level of contentment. Like, I don't need to do anything I'm not doing right now in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't last that long. <laughs> in that, like, I, I think I'm always trying to do a little bit more and always feel like I'm not doing enough. And it got that impatience and intolerance for, for what's getting done today is guided me in being a leader, I hope, and helping other people and hopefully pushing the edges of healthcare technology, whatever it is I'm doing. But I think it's, it's like true intimacy in a conversation with someone I love, or it's true contentment with this is enough. It just yeah. doesn't happen all that often for those of us who are just hungry. But yeah. it does happen every once in a while. Well, thank you so much. This has been very enlightening. I really appreciate your time uh, today, and uh, uh, we've learned a lot. So thanks for sharing Thanks. With us. This was like thank a little you. island today for me. So this was so fun to talk about these things that mean so much. Thank you. Thank you.